This is lesson 5.5, where we will be making connections between what we've learned about sinusoidal functions and real-world problems. Uh, also, later on, we will tackle instantaneous rate of change. Now, the first question has to do with the height of a car on a Ferris wheel. A sinusoidal function is a good one to use to model this problem because it repeats itself. So the car on a Ferris wheel will inevitably find itself at the same height over and over and over again uh, on multiples of certain period length. So example one, the height h in meters of a car above the ground as a Ferris wheel turns can be modeled using the function h equals 20 times the sine of pi t over 60 plus 25, where t is the time in seconds. Our job is to determine the average rate of change, h, over each time interval, rounded to three decimal places. And the idea here is that as we uh, take the average rate of change of these time intervals, we'll be getting closer and closer to the instantaneous rate of change at 10 seconds, which is part B of example one. So here we go. Let's take our first interval, five seconds to 10 seconds. And we want to find the average rate of change. We'll be using our average rate of change formula, which is simply h2 minus h1 over t2 minus t1. And we have here the general formula for the height of the car of the Ferris wheel. And so I'm going to go ahead and put that on there. And I've already inserted the values that we need for time in this case. So here you have 10 with the pi and minus, that's the difference between what's happening here, the height at 5 seconds and time 10 minus 5 at the bottom. And we punch that whole big thing into our calculator and the value of that rate of change is approximately 0 0.965. Okay, to approximate the next one, we're going to use the exact same formula. I'm simply going to change the values that we have here, and we're going to be using the difference between t equals 10 and t equals 9. And so I punch that uh, formula into my calculator, and I discover that the approximate rate of change over the interval from between 9 and 10 seconds is 0 0.920. And as you can see, we're getting closer and closer. Uh, to the instantaneous rate of change at 10 seconds. We've done the difference between 10 and 5, now the difference between 10 and 9. And for step 3, we will find the difference between 10 seconds and 9.9 .9 seconds. The average rate of change over this interval, the secant line that would cross the graph between 9.9 .9 and 10 seconds. And we discover that the Average rate of change for that interval is 0 0.908. Okay, one last one. We will change to getting even closer to the tangent line at 10 seconds. We're now doing the secant line between 10 and 9.99. .99. And we punch that guy into our calculator. Our approximate value comes out as. 0 0.907. And so we've clearly been working towards the tangent line at 10 seconds. Uh, it is now safe to tackle B, the instantaneous rate of change at 10 at t equals 10 seconds is about 0 0.907 meters per second. So this is all being measured in meters per second. C asks, what physical quantity does this instantaneous rate of change represent? So we have to remember here that we're talking about the average rate of change, instantaneous rate of change now, which was height over time. So height is changing with respect to time, and we want to see at what rate that is happening. A rate of change always has to do with velocity or speed. In this case, we're just talking about height. So we can safely say that the instantaneous rate of change represents the vertical speed 
of the car at t equals 10 seconds. D asks, would you expect the instantaneous rate of change of h to be the same at t equals 15 seconds? And justify your answer. We said earlier that we were modeling this function by a sine function. And so first what I'll do is draw a sine function. So we can have a look at what the sine function generally looks like. And we just discovered that the rate of change at t equals 10 seconds is approximately 0 0.901. So let's assume, let's say this is the slope of the tangent line at t equals 10 seconds. Can we safely assume that at t equals 15 seconds, that the slope of this tangent line, or in other words, the rate of change, will be the same? Well, we can see that this slope does repeat itself in the sine function. A sinusoidal function repeats. And so this slope will happen again, but not necessarily at t equals 15 seconds. So the easy answer to that one is, the instantaneous rate of change of h at t equals 15 seconds is not expected to be the same as at t equals 10 seconds. The graph of the sine function changes its slope continually. It would not likely yield the same value at a different value of t. The real life situation that is supplied for us in example two has to do with temperature over the course of a year in Moose Factory, Ontario. It states the variations in maximum daily temperatures for Moose Factory, Ontario on the first of the month from January to December are shown in the table below. We're going to write a sine function to model the data. A sine function is a appropriate model for this because temperature throughout the year repeats itself year to year. So here we go, the general formula for temperature in this situation is the sine function, and we have our constants, which will modify the sine function. Uh, we're gonna use the information given to us to find out what A is, K, what D is, and what C is, so that we can accurately find an accurate uh, function to represent this data. Okay, let's first find A, the amplitude. For this situation. The amplitude is half the difference between the maximum and minimum temperatures. So I simply find my maximum temperature, I subtract from it my minimum temperature, divide by 2, and discover that the amplitude is 18.2. I next want to take on the constant C. Constant C represents the vertical translation. It is the average of the maximum and minimum temperatures. So I take my maximum temperature, I add my minimum temperature, and divide by two to find the average of those temperatures. Again, my maximum is 22.4 degrees Celsius. I'm going to add my minimum temperature and divide by two which tells me that the constant at the end, the vertical uh, translation is 4.2. Next, we're going to find k. Now, this period length uh, from month to month is going to be one year. We're measuring in months, so the period length is going to be 12 months desired period is 12 months. So my period length is typically in a sine function 2 pi. And in order to find k, I need to divide 2 pi by 12. This is going to be our division triangle whereby we have 2 pi, and we have 12, which is the period length in this case. k is the constant that uh, we multiply the sine function by in order to get the desired period. So this tells me that k is equal to 2 pi over 12. 
which is equal to pi over 6. Okay, the period is 12. We now need to find the phase shift. Now, in a sine function, the maximum value occurs at one fourth of a period. I can draw that out. So we have our sine function here. And if this were the start point, and this were the end point, this would be 2 pi on the sine function. And we could split it into quarters. The maximum point happens at 1 fourth a period. Okay, so in this case, where the period length is 12 months, we know that the maximum value for the sine function is going to happen at t equals 3. The maximum value in this case, 12 months in the year, period of 12, occurs at t equals if the graph of this function was not going to be horizontally translated, if it was not going to have a shift phase, then we would expect to find the maximum in the third month. But if we look again at our table of values, we find that the maximum temperature of 22.4 degrees Celsius happens in the seventh month. So this function is being moved. The phase shift then is 7 minus 3 because uh, the maximum would generally occur at t equals 3 but we're told that it happens at t equals 7 so in order to move from 3 to 7 we need to move it 4 months to the right 4 months to the right is the phase shift so d equals 4 we now have enough information to write the sine function that models the data. Temperature here is equal to 18.2 times the sine pi over 6 times m minus 4 plus 4.2. In part B of the example, you are asked to make a scatter plot of the data. Go ahead and do that using the data that is in the table and the coordinate plane that is provided for you. And you'll see how well it uh, represents the sine function, or how well the sine function represents the data, rather, uh, which allows you to answer section C, for example, too. Example 4 has us using the sinusoidal function to represent the predator-prey relationship. Uh, this is often represented by sinusoidal functions because, again, you can see it repeats itself. So each of these lines, each of these curves, represents the population of an animal. The deer is in red and the wolf is in green. We are told that the population of the deer, which is the prey, in this area is represented by p of t, little p for prey, is equal to 2,000 plus 500 cos of t. We are also told that the population, the wolf population in this area, the same area where the deer are living, is represented by the formula P of T, or capital P for predator, is equal to 500 plus 100 times the sine of T. And so you can see that the starting population of the deer is much higher than that of the wolf, which is why on our graph here we have the vertical difference between deer and wolves. But we're going to see how these relate to each other. We've graphed them already for you over a period of
approximately 20 years, and now we're going to compare the two graphs. What's happening to the deer population when the wolf population is increasing? And what's happening to the deer population when the wolf population is decreasing? Let's first look at what's happening at the start. Here we have the wolf population increasing, and at the same time we have the deer population decreasing. Well, that makes sense. If there's going to be more wolves, they're going to be eating more deer, the deer population is going to decline. But at some point, the deer population is going to reach its local minimum. It's going to decline so significantly that the population of wolves cannot be supported by the population of the deer. And so the population of the wolves is going to decline. And when that starts happening, there are fewer wolves to eat the deer, and the population of the deer begins to increase. And so this is why it's a predator-prey relationship. These graphs are very dependent on each other. As there are fewer predators, there will be more prey. As there are, as there becomes to be more prey, then there's more food for the predators, and their population will increase, thereby reducing the prey population, and the cycle continues. That brings us to the end of Lesson 5.5. Some of the key concepts that you want to remember is that the instantaneous rate of change of a sinusoidal function will follow a sinusoidal pattern, which means it will repeat. Uh, many real-world processes can be modeled by the sinusoidal function, even if they do not involve angles. Any uh, relationship, anything where its uh, value is being repeated over a certain period of time, etc., can be represented by a sinusoidal function, although it usually requires the transformation of the basic sinusoidal function. And you can find that transformation based on data that is given. Go ahead and try your homework, page 296, numbers 1 through 4 and 6, the short one today.